everyone. Good morning, good afternoon. I'm Derek Chalet at the German Marshall Fund of the United States. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all here for a book talk with Bill Drozdiak, uh, where we will be discussing his latest book, The Last President of Europe, Emmanuel Macron's Race to Revive France and Save the World. Uh, Bill is uh, a good friend uh, uh, to, to me and to GMF. Bill is a longtime analyst of US European affairs for 20 years. He worked for the Washington Post as a correspondent in various parts of Europe uh, for 10 years. He was the president of the American Council on Germany. Uh, and this is his second book on Europe. Uh, and it's one that's come out to great acclaim just last weekend in the Washington Post. Uh, Bill's book received a terrific review and I just like to read one part of it. Uh, uh, review written, written by Benjamin Haddad of the Atlantic Council. And uh, in his review, he said that some new books will be rendered instantly obsolete by this pandemic, others only more relevant to understanding the world to come. William Drozdiak's The Last President of Europe belongs in the latter category. Drozdiak outlines the urgency of the French president's vision for a united and sovereign Europe and the high obstacles it faces. The pandemic places greater importance on both the vision and the hurdles. So this book would have been a really interesting read before this crisis. I would argue it's, even, it's an even more interesting and important read in light of this crisis. So it, it gives me great pleasure to, to welcome uh, uh, Bill back to GMF. I should also mention that uh, Bill is a GMF alum. He helped uh, uh, start GMF's Brussels office uh, some time ago. So it's, it's great to welcome him back to GMF to discuss this book. So Bill, great to see you. Thanks, Derek. And it's a pleasure to uh, be back with my friends at uh, GMF. Excellent. So Bill and I are going to talk uh, uh, for about a half an hour or so about the book. I got a bunch of questions for him, but then we're going to open it up to all of you and we'll be using uh, the Q&A function on the Zoom system. So if you have a question, uh, at any point, go ahead and put it in and we'll get to it uh, in about a half hour or so. Um, but to start things off, Bill, uh, I'd like to really start with the title, The Last President of Europe. Uh, what did you mean by that? Uh, and why would you say that Macron is the last president of Europe? Uh, well, it's an interesting question, Derek, and I get asked it a lot. And uh, when I started this project uh, more than a couple of years ago, in my first conversation with uh, President Macron, I was struck by the fact that here's this political neophyte who entered office with these, uh, he'd never been elected to public office before, and he ha came into uh, the presidency with these Herculean ambitions to modernize France, uh, to invigorate Europe and to uh, reshape the world order. And even though he'd never had really any foreign policy experience or political experience, he knew that all of these issues were interrelated, that France could only achieve uh, a full uh, uh, ranking with Germany if it uh, uh, modernized and reformed its economy. And once it did so, he believed that he would be able to convince Chancellor Merkel to uh, make a bold leap forward in terms of, uh, of reshaping Europe in a way that would enable it to adapt to the 21st century challenges, namely the resurgent big power competition with the United States, uh, China, and Russia. And uh, in elaborating his vision, he saw France and Europe as a mediating power among these big powers. He didn't, he insisted that this did not mean that Europe and France were becoming estranged or moving away from the close security relationship with the United States, but that it needed to carve out its own identity. And so by the last president of Europe, uh, I realized that uh, over the course of two years, he became deeply frustrated at, first of all, his inability to persuade Merkel to, uh, to make this leap forward and also other leaders. So he, when you looked around Europe in the last few weeks and months, you realized that uh, he is really the only leader in Europe who had been uh, 
preaching uh, for the need for a more uh, political community to evolve from Europe. Um, and he, uh, uh, you know, bemoaned the fact that uh, some countries that were once staunch European-minded uh, countries like the Netherlands and even Germany were following the path of economic nationalism, whatever would help them, their markets best, when his view was that, and I think it resonates with that of the founding fathers of Europe, like Jean Monnet and, and even Conrad Adenauer and, uh, and, uh, and de Gaulle, and right down through the, the close partnership between uh, Francois Mitterrand and Helmut Kohl, that Europe only could move forward with the two biggest powers uh, advancing together. And until recently, and just until last week, when Merkel and Macron came out with this common vision of, of, of a recovery fund for uh, Europe in the wake of the pandemic, that would help bolster the, uh, the country's hardest hit. Until then, it looked like he was a man preaching in the wilderness, that he was alone. And that's why the last chapter of my book is called Macron Alone. And indeed, the, the, the title, I think, still uh, stands up because he's having a hard time persuading the other leaders to follow him on this path toward um, making Europe not just a free trade area or um, an, in a common market, but really to have an integrated political community um, that uh, would, would really uh, help realize the vision of the founding fathers of Europe. Well, Bill, I definitely want to get to these relationships. Uh, you mentioned Merkel, uh, and I want to talk also about Trump and Putin. But before I get to that, I, I'd like to hear more from you about where Macron's views of Europe came from. Uh, you spent a lot of time with him in, in the research for this book. Uh, you talked about a lot of big philosophical questions with him. I believe you talked with him in, in French and he, he sort of felt more comfortable in some ways uh, opining and, and, and uh, being somewhat philosophical with you. So I think it's a very valuable window you offer. And, and what struck you in those conversations about how, how he came to, to see Europe and indeed the world the way he did, what in his background influenced him, um, and therefore how it, how it shaped his approach to, to his early years in office, but then also how you see it shaping his approach to this pandemic. I think the first thing uh, we saw with Macron when he uh, launched his bid for the presidency was that uh, he thought the political landscape was totally obsolete. He no longer believed in right versus left, um, progressive or, uh, let's say, socialistic views uh, versus conservative uh, free market. He thought that there had to be a whole new definition. That was the uh, concept behind his, uh, his uh, movement that he started, La République en Marche that uh, France needed to move beyond these, these definitions, and indeed not just France, but all of Europe and the rest of the Western world, that, uh, that what was, uh, was really facing us in a, a new generation uh, was the, uh, the 21st century challenges, and he saw this coming with the rise of the technology uh, challenges and the, the difficult obstacles that would pose to society. And I think the fact that uh, what I was taken by, because I'm 30 years older than he is, uh, that he represented a new generation. And it had particular relevance for me because I was writing this book with an American audience in mind. And here we are entering a presidential uh, uh, election campaign with, uh, with the, the, the two leaders of the major parties well into their 70s. Um, and so I thought Macron's uh, vision reflected uh, a, the, the perspective of a new generation. And I thought that was very important to, uh, to bring to the attention of American uh, readers. But what about his background and his upbringing? I mean, in terms of his education, uh, his, ex his life experience before he, he entered government service, entered politics, that you think most shaped his outlook? Well, I think uh, his, his his uh, unusual background, uh, family background, is, is quite well known. I mean, he was raised by two doctors in the northern industrial town of Amiens. Uh, 
and uh, the love of his life, uh, Brigitte, uh, uh, he met uh, when she was his drama teacher in high school. She's 24 years older than he is. Um, and uh, his, his parents sent him away to school in uh, Paris, hoping he would get over this adolescent crush. But he uh, doggedly pursued her, kept coming back to Amiens, and finally uh, she agreed to, uh, to marry him. So she's been an absolutely important influence. Politically, she's She's quite uh, astute. She uh, keeps her ear to the ground and has been a close political advisor. Uh, the other woman in his life who was very influential was his maternal grandmother, who taught him the value of uh, books and history and a love of reading. Um, and that, uh, you asked about who were his political influences. It's interesting. I, I uh, constantly ask people, uh, who was his mentor in, uh, in international affairs? Did he have a Raymond Aron type or a, a Henry Kissinger who was advising him on the side? And everybody said remarkably that he's an autodidact. He really develops his own thinking um, through uh, obsessive reading. He's, he stays up till three and four in the morning reading a lot. Uh, and I would say politically, the two influences were the philosopher Paul Ricoeur, uh, who, for whom he worked for a couple of years as an assistant, and Michel Rocard, who was uh, uh, prime minister under Francois Mitterrand. And I got to know Rocard when I was in Brussels, actually, with the German Marshall Fund setting up that office. Rocard was then uh, a member of the European Parliament. He was always one of the most imaginative uh, people and he just said that the social challenges of the 21st century will mean we have to reinvent education um, that we ne need to make it uh, possible for people to have three and four careers in their lives so that and uh, they ought to be a, a university ought to be a lifetime experience that you could go back to school in your 40s and if you were sick and tired of being a lawyer, you could reinvent yourself as an architect and this sort of thing. And he's, uh, he had these conversations. Macron was very attracted to this as well. And that helped influence his reformist ideas about changing completely the society in France, which for the past 40 years has been what uh, Michel Crozier called uh, la société bloquée. Uh, and I would say that this dis description applies very much to the United States. Um, and that, uh, that we ourselves have a blocked society and this led to all this frustration that has uh, made our political lives dysfunctional. So uh, again, you know, with Macron, I think that's where he thought that the traditional political establishment in France were not responding to the demands and needs of the French people. And that's what led him to uh, enter politics and run for the presidency, even though he had, uh, at the outset, absolutely no chance, according to the pundits, because he'd never been elected to office before. And Bill, I'm curious also about his views of the United States. Uh, and, and in your, the last part of your book, when you're talking with him about geopolitics, he has some very interesting perspectives on American foreign policy, and I'd like to hear your account of those. But also, he's someone who, who has thought a lot, as you think, thought deeply about the world, thought deeply about the United States. He has some experience here in the United States with the private sector. Also, we at GMF are proud that he's, he's an alumnus of the Marshall Memorial Fellowship, uh, in which he spent several weeks traveling around uh, the, the U.S., the American Midwest, and, and the American West. I'm just curious if, if in your discussions with him, you had a sense of his diagnosis of, of what's going on in the United States, and then how, therefore, how that is impacting America's role in the world. Well, it's interesting. He, he felt that a lot of the, um, the pre political pressures and changes that we are witnessing in our country were very similar to what Europe has going, been going through. I mean, the, the populist, nationalist, uh, rise in Europe uh, could be compared in some ways um, to the election of Donald Trump, um, the frustration with Congress that a lot of people express uh, that we need some kind of a new political um, um, generation to arise. Uh, the same, same phenomenon was happening in uh, France when, when he first entered politics. 
Uh, but as far as his understanding and knowledge of the United States, he's, yes, he made that, that trip as a Marshall Memorial Fellow, uh, and that had an impact on him. He traveled around the United States, places like Pittsburgh and elsewhere. Uh, but he saw come back uh, on and off, and I think one of the areas where, uh, which really captivated him was uh, Silicon Valley um, and the technology, the uh, amazing achievements of uh, um, the United States in terms of technology. Well, an interesting fact that, uh, that I, realized, I came to realize during, this, um, during the process of the research on the book was that uh, uh, the French, young French people are a highly desirable commodity in, um, in Silicon Valley. Uh, the one thing the French educational system does well is teach mathematics. And there is a reservoir of about 80,000 young French people who have gravitated uh, to uh, the greater uh, San Francisco Bay Area. Not all of them are in working for high tech companies, but a lot of them are. And they become, um, that, in a way, that was a brain drain. Uh, the, the, the best and the brightest of the young generation in France were either moving to London or else to, uh, to the United States, and notably Silicon Valley. Macron saw that and he wanted to lure them back. So he's made several trips out there and he's talked with entrepreneurs and he realized this was what was lacking in France, that uh, they needed to reinvent an entrepreneurial spirit, which of course the word is French, but it's been lacking because um, um, France still has, uh, I think the largest uh, uh, percentage of its economy held by, by controlled by the state close to 50%, whereas other countries, even Sweden, Scandinavia, um, is, uh, which are known for socialistic uh, state control, have greatly reduced that. So he, need, he wanted to do that, and he, and he thought the important thing to, uh, to achieve that would be to lure back these young entrepreneurs from Silicon Valley. So that, I think that shaped his views of the United States. He felt that he feels that, like other observers for, in Europe, that we have a very dysfunctional political class, that we can't seem to get things achieved in Washington because of the, the paralysis between Republicans and Democrats on Capitol Hill here. But at the same time, there's this tremendous uh, drive and, uh, and uh, skill set and uh, uh, fostered by uh, terrific educational institutions that has placed the United States uh, uh, in the lead uh, for new technologies. Now, the question is whether that is going to continue or if our educational system uh, uh, declines uh, and erodes further, that uh, we will lose this uh, lead. But uh, that's his, his view of the United States. Now, politically, I would say that um, <clears throat> he felt the United States has been moving away from Europe uh, in the sense uh, that uh, it's understandable three generations after the end of World War II uh, that uh, a lot of Americans, he, in his mind, would feel uh, it's time for Europe to take care of its own backyard. Uh, it's wealthy enough and it ought to be able to do that rather than depend uh, for even after 75 years after World War II, continue to depend on the United States. So I think as an uber realist, and I think that's the best description of his political philosophy, um, um, that's, uh, that's what he thinks of the United States. Bill, I'd like to turn to the, the question of his some of the key relationships, leader relationships that he's had. And your book offers a really fascinating description of how Macron both uh, sized up and then approached three very different and formidable uh, counterparts, Donald Trump, Angela Merkel, and Vladimir Putin. And I think it's quite uh, interesting how you and your conversations with Macron were able to get him to speak pretty candidly about uh, his views on these leaders and how he's tried to uh, generate relationships with them that could further his goals. Uh, in some, some instances, he succeeded, uh, some not so much. Uh, but if you could talk a little bit about those, maybe take in any order you choose, but Merkel, Putin, and Trump, both how he's seen those relationships, how he's worked to try to develop them, 
and perhaps where he succeeded or, or fallen short? Sure. Well, I think the personal relationships uh, to Macron matter very much. And that's why uh, his first day in office, uh, after appointing his prime minister, he flew off to Berlin uh, to meet with Merkel. And uh, she said uh, quite famously, quoting um, um, uh, Hermann Hesse, there is, there is magic in every first meeting. Uh, but then she added, but the magic only lasts until the, uh, when there are results. And uh, so he was, uh, hopeful that, that he'd be able to build this um, partnership with Merkel on a personal level, the way that Francois Mitterrand and Helmut Kohl, two very different personalities, managed to achieve uh, uh, great things uh, for Europe um, in the wake of, uh, of Germany's reunification. Uh, but gradually he became very disappointed with, uh, with Merkel's uh, innate caution. Uh, She's a, a leader who is not really a visionary. Unlike Cole, who defied uh, the majority view of Germans, 70% of them at the time were opposed to uh, giving up the Deutschmark in favor of the Euro. And Cole said, we're just going to drive through like a bulldozer and we're gonna push this through because he said it's a matter of war and peace in his mind for Europe. And uh, he tried to persuade Merkel that said, you know, look, this is important for your legacy. You've now been in power for well over 10 years. Uh, you need to defend Europe. And he tried every argument that it's in Germany's interest um, because uh, having established peaceful and prosperous relationships with all of its uh, partners and, and, and the members of the European Union it was important to sustain that. Uh, and he saw the damage that was done uh, with the Greek uh, crisis in the, uh, with the Euro uh, uh, 10 years ago, that uh, the Greeks became infuriated when much of the first tranche of bailout money was used to bail out German banks that had made bad investments in, uh, in, um, in Greece. So he tried to persuade her that uh, she needed to, to step up her vision of Europe, but that debt didn't really work. And so, <clears throat> well, I in my travels around Europe, it was inter I was able to, uh, I went to Berlin where I had a number of good contacts and wanted to get to the heart of this. And it was interesting that uh, I think it was at a dinner party in Berlin, Wolfgang Schäuble, who was then her finance minister, uh, was asked, we asked her, um, asked him, you know, what's the difference between you and Merkel in your approach to Europe? And, uh, he said, the is nicht von Europa emotional geprägt, which I translated, I quote him in the book, I translated that as saying, you know, she is not emotionally invested in Europe the way that he and Helmut Kohl were. Um, um, and I remember having interviewed Kohl in 1985 when I was the Washington Post correspondent in Germany, and I went down to his um, uh, home in Ludwigshafen. He took me out to his backyard. We were talking about uh, European politics, and he said, Come see with me, Herr de Bosdiak. And in the backyard, he pointed in the distance to what he called with France, and then he pointed to the ground. He said, I'm convinced that the blood of French and German soldiers are mixed in the ground here in my backyard, and I'm committed to never seeing that happen again. Well, Merkel grew up in the East, and so she did not have this emotional attachment to the great achievement of the European Union, which was to make war between France and Germany unthinkable. For 500 years, they'd been, every generation of Germans and French had been either planning to go to war or, or, or fighting with each other, and now that's is is unimaginable for for generations now three generations since the war and so for Cole and for Schäuble those who grew up in the west who, who saw that you know this is why the European Union is such a precious thing to uh, preserve and, uh, and with its achievements and so it's understandable on a personal basis why and I think Macron finally came to realize that but he tried to argue from a uh, economic point of view, that it's in Germany's interest, if uh, Italy and Spain collapse along with Greece, that this is going to be very damaging to uh, Germany's economy and 
Um, and I think it was Danny Cohn Bendy who said, uh, you know, a, a, the collapse of Europe would be a suicide for Germany. Uh, and this is what um, he, he insisted Merkel would have to avoid. In terms of Putin, I think uh, the, the, the first thing he told me about Putin was, uh, never forget he's the son of St. Petersburg and that he has a Western outlook. And he said, every time I meet with him, I make a point of bringing up Dostoevsky and Pushkin and uh, reminding him of the great cultural links that Russia, particularly St. Petersburg, has with the West. Uh, and since he's patterned himself in something of a modern czar, he, he also tries to flatter, uh, Macron would try to flatter him by comparing him to Peter the Great saying this is what Peter the Great would do in your shoes, this sort of thing. Um, so he realizes it's a long-term process. And when he came out with his comments, and he said this not just to me, he did this in an interview with uh, The Economist and with the Financial Times more recently, talking about Putin as uh, well, we need to develop him as a partner uh, for the West. And his conviction is that 10, 20 years from now, Europe is never going to be um, uh, a, a secure and prospering place unless it can reach some kind of a, a foreign security agreement or understanding with Russia. So I think that's what has been driving his, his views. And that's why he cultivates, continues to cultivate Putin, even though uh, his misbehavior is, uh, is uh, infuriating for him, such as, you know, spying on the uh, on the, the, the you know, interfering with the French election as well as with the American elections. Uh, as far as Trump goes, I, I mentioned earlier that I believe the defining philosophy is uber realism for, uh, for Macron. And unlike Merkel, who after her first meeting said, I just can't stand being in the same room with that man. And I, she told Macron, look, you know, you want to deal with them, that's fine with me, you know, because the less I have to deal with them, the better. And he realized that Europe could not just um, abandon the United States as closest ally, um, even if they had a president that uh, European leaders found uh, distasteful. So he felt that there were, it was important to cultivate areas where he, he thought he had a, a common ground with, uh, with Trump. And uh, he made a point of mentioning, we're both mavericks. We both destroyed and up, upset the political establishment. Uh, we both have a belief that the private sector should wor work more effectively with, uh, with the public sector, with the state. Um, and so, uh, you know, the, he said, even though we have a di we're, we represent different generations, we ought to find ground where we can work together. And uh, you know, it, it's uh, you've got to hand him some credit for trying, but of course, it's been uh, it hasn't achieved what he had hoped uh, it would be. And there were examples when it seemed to be possible. And I think the biggest um, effort that Macron made was to try and find some room for reconciliation between Iran and the United States. And he felt he came very close at one point, but it fell apart. Yeah, Bill, I wanted to ask you about that just as a, as a brief case study in how Macron both tried to handle Trump and his vision of France as a mediating power. If you could talk a little bit about the inside story of his efforts to uh, work with the Trump administration first in its efforts to unwind or strengthen and then unwind the JCPOA, but then also to mediate some kind of dialogue between the two sides. I thought that was very interesting and revealing. Right. Well, this was, he'd been working on this for after, um, I think it was the, the state visit in Washington when uh, Macron came here as the first uh, foreign leader invited by Trump for a state visit, which, uh, he thought pretended well for him, and he gave a speech to both houses of Congress. Um, but it was clear that uh, in those conversations uh, that uh, Macron uh, came away disappointed because he realized that Trump was going to walk out of the JCPOA, which he did several weeks later. But Macron never gave up hope. He thought there might be a way to uh, 
bring the United States back, and he was searching for some kind of a, uh, of an effort to do so. Uh, he, he helped mediate uh, or, or at least tone down tensions at a time when it looked like the United States and Iran might go to war. Uh, when there was a standoff with their with uh, some uh, some naval vessels, um, but it all came to a head, I think, at the G7 summit in late August of last year, when um, uh, Trump arrived and um, in Biarritz, and Macron pulled him aside. They went off for a two-hour lunch without aides, just the two of them speaking English over lunch. And he told Trump, he said, I'm going to invite Javad Zarif. He's coming here tomorrow. And I want to uh, work out uh, a potential breakthrough that we could follow up on the following month at the, in, in late September in New York at the United Nations General Assembly with Hassan Rouhani, the prime minister. And uh, he explained all of this to Trump, and Trump said, oh, that's a great idea, I'm all for it. Well, meanwhile, John Bolton, his national security advisor, was briefing the press saying, we've been blindsided by uh, Macron and the French. And then when Trump was asked about it, he said, oh no, this was, I knew all about it. And I had the best lunch of my presidency with Macron just yesterday. Um, but they hoped that this might uh, lay the ground. So Zarif came to uh, Biarritz, and uh, even the, Trump did not meet with him, but Macron did and his foreign minister, and they were laying the ground for what they thought would be this breakthrough meeting the following month. So I was in New York with Macron uh, for that uh, UNGA, and we met shortly before, and then he was watching his clock. He said, well, I better run off, and he was going to see uh, Rouhani at nine o'clock, and uh, Trump was willing to meet with him, but Rouhani decided at the last minute, no, this would uh, be too um, politically difficult and embarrassing for him with the hardliners he has it to deal with at home. And so Macron got there and said, well, how about a phone call? And he was there out of, in Macron's, um, I mean, in um, Rouhani's uh, hotel suite, and Rouhani had retreated to the bedroom he had Zarif go knock on the door and he said, uh, will you at least come out and take a phone call? And he goes, no, I'm in my pajamas. And I, <laughs> so that fell, uh, fell through because uh, the Iranians felt when they got up to the, the point at which uh, there would be at least a conversation or a meeting between Trump and, and Rouhani, that this would be exploited by, by the Americans and they would not get anything in return for it. And what they were holding out for was the lifting of sanctions, uh, and that wasn't going to happen. So, uh, as you said, you know, his his ambition for Europe is, and and France is to be a mediating power, and I thought this was a perfect example of that. Well, Bill, I just have a couple more questions left, and we already do have some questions in from viewers. Uh, so if you have a question, we'll be turning to those very shortly. So use the Q&A function to send it along. Um, and I, Bill, I'd like to talk to you about the kind of Macron's big picture thoughts uh, when he, you, you push him, and I think very admirably so, you push him to uh, think 30 years into the future. So this book has a lot of really interesting tidbits and and inside stories like you just relayed on Iran, but it's also uh, a really interesting perspective of a world leader trying to think about the direction of geopolitics. And you ask him at one point, and you, you, this account is towards the end of your book about, you know, how do you think the world's gonna look in 30 years? Uh, and he has some really interesting answers. Uh, one that I, I was not expecting. If you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. I, yeah, I mean, we were meeting to discuss geopolitics, um, and uh, he, and that, as he often does, he turned the tables on his uh, interviewer and said, well, what for you has been your most transformative experience? And I said, well, I'm 30 years older than you, but uh, I would have to say it was the fall of the Berlin Wall, the collapse of the Soviet Union, and maybe later on the rise of, of China, certainly as a journalist. That's that those were the major events in my career. Um, and I said, what about you? And where do you think, uh, what do you think will be the most dramatic event uh, that you will live through over the course of the next 30 years? Cause you're, he was then 40 years old. And 
what he said did surprise me. He said, I think it'll be the spectacular transformation of Africa. And he cited, he, he had this on the tip of his uh, fingers. I mean, the, the, the demographic figure, he said, by the end of the century, one out of every three human beings will be African. Um, that uh, we in Europe with our demographic decline will require the infusion of, uh, of a younger generation of people. And he then cited the uh, French historian, Fernand Brodel, who wrote these famous the, the volumes about the Mediterranean and how Europe and Africa had interchanged over the course of, uh, of centuries. And he said, I think this would, could be the era in which there could be a new Euro-African uh, civilization that, that arises. Um, and he felt that in particular, what he was encouraged by, because he's made many trips to Africa, and it's interesting, he has installed as ambassadors, French ambassadors throughout Africa, some of the French, the lead, top French diplomats, and in particular, those who are closest to him, like the ambassador to South Africa, Aurelien Le Chevalier, had been his deputy diplomatic advisor uh, and, and had been with him since, since childhood. And his view is that we need to cultivate a, a whole new partnership. And leading that, uh, that drive, uh, he believes, are women in Africa. He says, because the, uh, once we, if we can help with the liberation of women in Africa, they tend to be, uh, some of the, uh, the leading entrepreneurs in Africa tend to be women. And if we can get them out of the cultural rut that they find themselves in, where they're you know, left to be barefoot and having seven or eight kids, and we can get them uh, to unleash their uh, entrepreneurial uh, skills and their, their, their drive, then this would help transform uh, Africa. So I think that's where he sees, uh, you know, he's already made several trips there. He's persuaded Merkel to uh, come down there and talk about a Marshall Plan that would help Africa. But all of this will be... Uh, affected very much by the post-pandemic world, because you can imagine uh, if Africa has a raging pandemic that, uh, that afflicts, you know, let's say half the population uh, throughout Africa, that this is going to drive the immigration from the south into, uh, into Europe in a way that is going to supercharge uh, the message of the populist nationalists. And you see some of that happening already in Spain and of course in Italy. Um, and this, he, he realizes uh, is a serious danger. So it's the development of Africa is vital, um, not just for uh, the benefits it will bring to Africa, but also because of the benefits it would bring to Europe because they need to prevent this panicked uh, wave of desperate immigrants coming north. Bill, uh, I've got one last question, and then we're going to open it up uh, to the audience. Um, and you know, every book is a journey. You you start out knowing the story you want to tell and have a sense of where it's going, but then, of course, particularly when you're doing such deep reporting as you've done in this book and had so many conversations with so many interesting people, you get surprised. And I'm just curious, what what surprised you the most in in doing this book? What, what sort of what Diversions did you end up taking that you weren't expecting uh, in in the writing of this book? Well, I think uh, I was pleasantly surprised by the candor and openness that that Macron showed. And in some ways, I benefited from the fact that he is a political neophyte, and felt that. And we were speaking French, and he appreciated that fact that uh, here was an American uh, speaking speaking French with him. And of course, it was beneficial because he could express himself with the nimbleness and uh, articulation that uh, that he he has in his mother tongue but I, I i asked him in a way at one point when he was dealing with the uh, gilet jaune crisis which came as a complete uh, surprise to him and many pundits just totally out of the blue and drove him into a, a personal depression i think it was during the 
month of December of uh, 2018 would have been. And he basically retreated to the Elysee Palace for three weeks, didn't see anybody. Uh, friends of his were saying, we're worried about him because we're getting desperate uh, telegram messages. Telegram was the app that he used. That was his preferred app. At three and four in the morning, and he was only sleeping like three hours. Uh, and one uh, friend who went there to see him said he looked disheveled, he lost weight, et cetera. And he came out of that with the idea of, uh, of reconnecting uh, or relaunching his political campaign, uh, which he did, uh, going out um, and meeting the people uh, on the ground. This became known as the great national debate, the, the, grand, the great complication, as I call it. Um, in which he would stand up there and take uh, verbal abuse from populations and communities for like up to seven hours. And, and uh, his staff was just cringing about this. They said, you know, what an exercise in humiliation. But uh, he felt it was necessary in order to somehow get, uh, uh, break the, uh, the momentum of this, of these Gilets jaunes protests. So when uh, things started dying down. I remember seeing uh, it was February, um, in late February of, uh, of 2019. Um, and I went to see him at the Elysee. And I, at one point in the conversation, I asked him, well, what, what has surprised you the most about being president for, in these two years? And he sort of leaned back. And I mentioned that uh, um, when I had talked, uh, interviewed Bill Clinton, a time when I was working with the Post, I asked him a similar question after his first two years in office, and Clinton said, "It's here I am as president, the most powerful job in the world, and I realize only realize how powerless I am because there's Congress and other others who impede what you want to try to achieve." And I told him that story, and he said, "No, I wouldn't say that." He said, "But he leaned back and he just said." Said so what has shocked and surprised me the most has been uh, the uh, the poisonous venom uh, venomous uh, uh, connections that politics has led. And he said, uh, you know, the, I had never anticipated that people would would uh, be willing to you know hang me from from uh, you know the a tree or. or or guillotine me, but he said that's become common parlance. And uh, he said it's one thing to disagree with people on matters of policy, but to personalize it in such a way. He just said, I, I just can't fathom it. That there's something wrong with our societies, both in the United States and, and in Europe, when we become so vicious and, uh, and, and brutal to each other over, over politics. Well, Bill, picking up on that theme, I'm going to bunch some questions together. We're going to get to the audience questions now. And, and the first two come from Dieter Ditka and Akram Zawi about the long-term outlook on Macron and his political outlook on Macron and his party, uh, given the, the, the pretty rough waters that he's, he's run into uh, in, the first few, in his first few years in office. Uh, as well as, as his plan, and you just talked about some of this in relation to the, to the, the great debate, uh, but how he's planning on overcoming the strong social internal opposition to his reform projects within France, but then also at, at the EU level, the resistance at the EU level, particularly from Eastern European countries, to adhere to his vision of, of what Europe should be. Um, talk, talk a bit about, about Kind of your your sense of, of where this is headed, given the fact that he's he's gotten into some political trouble uh, and his poll numbers have been pretty low. Uh, uh, but then also what the plan is in terms of trying to bring along parts of Europe that uh, uh, have a very strong alignment with the United States and a very strong fear of Russia. All right. Well, I think the, he's uh, he will be up for re-election in uh, two years' time, and that's a long, that's an eternity in politics, so a lot can happen. But the aftermath, how he navigates this post-pandemic era is going to be an enormous challenge, not just for him, but also for, for other leaders in Europe and around the world. Um, and I think that, that, that 
he, he wants to seize this uh, challenge as an opportunity as to reinvent Europe. I think he's still committed to the view that uh, uh, Europe must be uh, uh, pursue the path of its founding fathers, become what he doesn't use the term United States of Europe. He says, you know, we need to become an integrated political community. And I think that's what he, in his appeals with Merkel, he finally prevailed in getting her to change her mind um, and accept uh, a version of, uh, you know, of shared debt um, because uh, that you have to think of, of Europe. Uh, Europe is only going to come together if we can help, um, if Europeans can help each other in their time of need. And certainly this has been a huge disappointment for Italians um, who, who thought that, that their, their partners would come to their rescue. They didn't. And that's why you've seen a spike in Euro skepticism among Italians. And so I think he was able to prevail and convince Merkel that uh, this, uh, this crisis is so deep and existential that Europe has to be reinvented. And maybe he will succeed in convincing other leaders in Europe that, uh, that something dramatic like making these, these bold steps forward and uh, using uh, <clears throat> this crisis as a way to uh, make, uh, uh, convince the rest of Europe to have a more co cohesive strategic vision. Um, because I think he's very open-minded. It's, it's, he is not, I would not argue to say that he is uh, espousing the traditional Gaullist view, which says, you know, we can, Europe can only define itself in contradistinction to the United States, you know, which, which Gaul, the Gaul did pulling, uh, pulling France out of NATO's integrated military command in uh, the 1960s and uh, and making those arguments. I think he wants to see, I think he recognizes on the horizon in the United States, um, the, the, uh, the fact that America, the American public wants to see uh, their European allies do more for their own security. And he says, why, you know, we don't disagree. We, we should be doing this. Uh, it's, he, he says it's unfortunate that Germany has not been doing, but France, now with the exit of uh, Great Britain is the leading military power on the European continent. And it's been doing things in terms of uh, counterterrorism in the Sahel and West Africa, which it, in, in occasional partnership with the United States, which have been very laudable. Um, and I think, uh, but they feel also that they don't, they haven't been getting enough support from their other European partners. So there's going to be this effort, I think, to uh, reinvent um, solutions to the European security. You mentioned uh, uh, the, uh, the hesitations, I think, and apprehensions of, uh, of um, Central and Eastern European, notably Baltic states, who still fear that Russia is their number one security concern and that uh, if Europe tries to do too much on its own, that the United States would abandon them. Now, I think it's, uh, <clears throat> I think his argument would be, um, we understand how you feel nervous about Russia being right in your backyard, but that, that argues all the more for the need for some kind of a, a greater understanding and dialogue with Russia. So that we shouldn't be afraid of this. Um, and that's what will need to happen over the course of the next two years. It'll, few years that will be, one assumes it will be in a post-Putin era and there will be different people in charge uh, in Russia that will, will come to, to see this. I mean, it makes a very good case in saying, look, if I were sitting in the Kremlin today, um, I would not see the West as, uh, my biggest security threat. I would see Islamic uh, fanaticism in the southern uh, parts of Russia, and I would look at Chinese encroachment on the eastern parts of Russia, and particularly in Siberia, where Russia doesn't have enough uh, manpower to uh, watch its borders, and Chinese populations have been encroaching and moving into their, their territory there. So this is the last time you have the last 
last thing you would expect is to pick a fight with the West. And, uh, but yet that is what uh, Putin has done in order to try and shore up a sense of nationalist purpose um, within his own population. But he said that's not, that's not an enduring solution to, to Russia's security problems. And we need to, to express that and have more exchanges with him on that. But he said that's how we hope, uh, he would hope to bring along uh, European partners in his thinking. Bill, along those lines, we've had a couple of questions come in about Macron's views on NATO. And of course, during the course of your writing the, of this book, he gave his famous interview to The Economist where he talked about NATO is brain dead, probably the, the utterance that got the most attention of his entire presidency so far, at least in the United States. So really interested in your take on that. And, and very, more specifically from Bob Bell, uh, our friend Bob Bell asks that you were among the first to report that Macron was willing to extend the French nuclear umbrella to the EU. And, and to get your take on that, and if he elaborated at all exactly how he envisions uh, uh, that to work, uh, particularly with EU member states such as Germany. Sure. Yeah. So NATO and the nuclear umbrella, his general. Uh, right, right. Well, the, the brand dead comment, yeah, that he gave to uh, Sophie Petter, the economist bureau chief in Paris there, during their interview. <clears throat> which was, I guess, last October or something. I think it was said with a very clever strategic purpose on Macron's part. It happened, he wanted that to appear. He wanted to shock NATO leaders who were going to be gathering in London, I think two or three weeks later, for their summit. And he had been infuriated by the decision by the Trump administration and by the president himself to... Uh, uh, abandon the Kurdish allies in uh, eastern Syria, and um, and that left uh, very dangerously exposed uh, a couple hundred special forces from the French military. And um, he said, I I don't know whether he mentioned in this interview, but I I had these convers a conversation later with that what he was trying to say, you know, NATO is brain dead. What what is the main purpose of NATO? Uh, you know, it's to consult and coordinate with your allies. And here we are, we have special forces in Eastern Syria working uh, closely with the American forces and without any, um, any inkling of what's gonna happen, we, we hear that the United States is now suddenly pulling, a, pulling out and we have no say in this. And I think that was directly what, uh, the direct implication, that's why he, he came out with this brain dead uh, comment. And he, he achieved his goal, which was when they met, of course, he was, he was uh, criticized by a lot of leaders in NATO for making such a, a outrageous comment, but uh, he, he achieved his aim, which was to have a focused conversation and saying, look, what is the purpose of NATO if we can't coordinate in delicate uh, military situations such as Eastern Syria. And, um, you know, I think Sophie followed that up saying, do you believe in Article 5? And he says, well, I don't know. It depends on the circumstances, what would, would happen. Uh, but this, is, this has come back, trying, I remember Henry Kissinger kicking up a huge furor in the early 80s when uh, he was once asked at a, at a think tank conference, uh, do you believe that, uh, do you think the Europeans believe um, that uh, the United States would sacrifice Chicago in a nuclear standoff if, if, if the Soviet Union was going to launch a nuclear attack on Hamburg? And uh, Kissinger said, probably not. And of course, everybody said, well, what's, you know, how can you believe in Article 5? Uh, I think this is that nuclear strategy is. Um, is going to be, I think, one of the biggest challenges facing a new gener a new administration uh, coming if uh, if Joe Biden wins the presidency, uh, and if we get a second uh, Trump administration, then uh, we could be looking, I think, at the imminent demise of, of the alliance. Things have gotten that bad, but I mean, with the withdrawal from arms control treaties, um, uh, Europeans feel. 
uh, abandoned, neglected, because there's no INF treaty left to uh, support them. And now with the Open Skies uh, Treaty being abandoned by the United States, they feel that how can we, uh, you know, how can we depend on, on the United States? So it's going to be very difficult to uh, reestablish uh, that trust. I mean, this goes back to, in my interviews in, in Berlin, I was asking a number of uh, senior German officials, what, the, what has sown the distress? He says, we have, we have lost faith in the United States ever since you pulled out of the ABM treaty, which was way back in George W. Bush's day. So, um, you know, arms control is, uh, for Europeans and Germans especially, is a, is a, central, is a central factor. Now, you mentioned the, the interview I had with him. I, it came, uh, I think there was a French-German treaty that he and Merkel signed in, in Aachen uh, in February of last year. And I noticed that I, I read through the treaty and there was some language in there that was quite striking in which it said, uh, in the event of attack, um, uh, 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 event of attack on Germany, France will use all means at its disposal to defend German territory. So a week or so later, I went in to see Macron and uh, we were talking about the very thing that I asked him about this and I said, does that mean you are prepared to extend the French nuclear deterrent to protect German territory? And he kind of leaned back and smiled and he says, you know, I, I compliment you for your insight because no other journalist has asked me that question yet. And he said, we, are, uh, we negotiated every word in that treaty. And um, that was uh, a central factor. And he's... I th I've learned subsequently, he gave a speech about the nuclear deterrent. He's, he is prepared to now make it a European deterrent. He's offered to, um, he's had uh, talks with the Prime Minister of Spain about extending um, the, a nuclear umbrella over, over Spain as well. So I don't think uh, Merkel wanted to uh, make an issue of it because uh, she realized the uh, nuclear issues are so neuralgic for the German population that uh, the last thing they wanted to do yeah, was to stir up uh, another nuclear debate. But, uh, but I think that's what you could see this, uh, this moving more. Now that, that uh, France is the, uh, the strongest military power on the European continent, um, with that will be a subject for discussion in the months and years to come. Well, Bill, we're about out of time, but I want to squeeze in a couple more questions. Uh, so I'll ask, I'll ask them very quickly and get a quick response from you. Uh, a couple viewers have asked about Macron's views on other global institutions. We've talked a lot about the EU uh, in this conversation. Uh, but also his view, you've mentioned the G7, but his, his view on the structure of global governance. So whether it's the G7, UN Security Council, G20, did he talk at all about how he sees kind of global governance moving forward, given the new realities that we're all facing? Yeah, um, no, yeah. sorry, go ahead. No, is and then secondly, and, yeah, second, the second part, which is, uh, You've talked about the potential that there's a new administration here in the United States that may be more congenial to some of his ideas about Europe and international issues, whether it be Iran or climate change or trade, for example. How do you, th how do you this is spec in the land of speculation, but how do you think he would approach a Biden administration uh, uh, when it comes into office, given that his presidency has been conjoined? I mean, you, one can't really understand this presidency without Trump at this point, right? I mean, how does he how does he recalibrate if there's a, a, a different outlook here in Washington? Right. Well, I think just to uh, well, just to start with the, the the last part of your question, I think he would welcome the idea of uh, an administration that wants to uh, renew and revitalize um, uh, connections with uh, European allies. I mean, he tried this early on, the first conversation he had with Trump in the White House was saying, we need to have a common strategy in dealing with China. And uh, the, that Europe and the United States uh, as uh, leading democracies in the world can, can uh, 
uh, can really um, exert um, a, a common vision only by working together and dealing with uh, the, the challenge of China. And he was interrupted by Trump. What do you mean? He says, uh, you know, Europe is much worse than China. And look what Germany is doing to our car market and all this stuff. And uh, so he wouldn't buy it. But I think this is what he would seek. He would welcome a new administration that, uh, that would be willing to examine ways to uh, invigorate the Atlantic Alliance, starting with a common approach to uh, China start, uh, and leading to, if necessary, a new Atlantic Charter that would, would, would uh, redefine the security responsibilities, that would alleviate the burden on the United States so that it, we could turn our attention, as <clears throat> we've been doing really since, the, and this, as he says, predates uh, Trump. It, it, goes back to the Obama administration even before, looking more toward Asia. Um, and so it would free up the hands of the United States in a way that Europe would be able to take charge of its own destiny, as both he and Merkel have said. Um, and I think this reflects his, uh, so I, that's where I push back on those who say, oh, he's, he's just spouting the usual Gaullist anti-NATO stuff. No, I think he's, uh, He's very much a multilateralist um, in his core uh, thinking, and uh, starting with the EU, uh, making that into a stronger political community, uh, making NATO more functional, uh, closer coordination on all sorts of things, such as post-pandemic security issues, um, and also uh, uh, reforming and invigorating uh, international institutions, whether it's the World Health Organization or the United Nations Security Council itself. Uh, so I think he realizes that uh, all of these institutions that were so vital in establishing 70 years of peace and prosperity uh, when they were founded at, in the aftermath of World War II, need a you know a makeover need a need a need to be renovated in a way that they are adapted to the the security challenges of the 21st century and frankly it's very hard to argue against them uh on that on that point well bill that's a that's a great point to end uh i want to thank you again for writing this book uh this would be the but the part of the program where if we were in 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 person uh, we would ask everyone to go buy a book and then line up and you could sign it. But instead, what I'm going to ask everyone to do is go buy a book online. It, we've sent around a link to a local bookstore here in Washington, but uh, from wherever you are, uh, I would highly recommend this book. We've just barely scratched the surface of uh, the ideas and the insights and the interesting stories that Bill presents in this book. Uh, so, Bill, I want to thank you again for taking the time to talk about it, congratulate you on its publication. Uh, please, everyone, go check it out. Um, and thanks, everyone, for joining uh, on this, uh, this discussion. We'll be doing another uh, book talk next month. Uh, uh, and we'll be trying to do these uh, periodically here now throughout the summer. But Bill, thanks again for joining us. Congrats. My pleasure, Derek. Great being with you. OK, thanks, everyone. Have a great week. Bye-bye.